It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. All right. We're back. You know, one of the problems I think that we have and one of the reasons why Americans don't have faith in the in the conservative ideology that is currently uh, dispensed by the Republican Party is because they don't have a plan that accurately represents an alternative to Obamacare. And I think that has become a specific area that has injured the Republican Party. Forget the fact that they're all for sale anyway, but let's assume for argument's sake that they were actually operating in our best interest. I know that's a broad leap, but just ride with me for this, for this few moments. Jump with me across the chasm of logic. <laughs> and let, let's, let's evaluate this from an from a objective perspective and assume that, for argument's sake, that the Republicans do truly have America's best interest at heart. The problem that they have is that they are about as creative as the caveman. They're doing the same things the same way that they've been doing them for a thousand years. And nothing's changed. The truth is, they are not inventive, nor are they creative. And the, and, and, and the principles that they are supposed to be uh, espousing and living by, and an example of, they've abandoned the principles of free market capitalism and free enterprise. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, America is confused, because they see this broad government nanny state taking over every aspect of our lives, and the people who rail against it, their only argument is, this isn't good. Okay, well, show us something better. They can't. Because they themselves have abandoned the principles of free market, free enterprise, free capital, free market enterprise capitalism. They have abandoned it a long time ago. They're so caught up in the regulatory scheme and, and, and the benefits that come with that to them directly as a result of payoffs and bribes that they can no longer even think objectively. And that's, that's the problem. You know what? There's no inventor who would sit there and with a, pre, with a preconceived idea of what he's, got to, what he's got to invent, not look at alternatives. He wouldn't get very far. If you were to sit there and you're saying, okay, I'm trying to create a new product here, and I got this great idea. But, you know, some people who gave me some money to buy the equipment I need said I can only do it this way. And I know that's going to lead to failure, but they're demanding that I do it this way. So what happens? The great invention, the greatest invention maybe is never realized. And that's the problem we have here. The, the Republicans are so uncreative that they have not yet in all of this time and they've had. You know, I hear people say, oh, the Obama administration's had three and a half years to fix this website. Guess what? The Republicans have had three and a half years to come up with an alternative solution to it, and they have utterly, miserably, and epically failed. Not just talking point solutions, real-world solutions. Come up with a bill that says Americans can have health care savings accounts. Come up with solutions that's, that remove regulation and replace innovation, creativity, logic, integrity back into the process and self-reliance and self-governance. That's what this should really be about. Make people responsible for their own expenses in healthcare, 
and you'll watch the price of health care competitively come down. We've seen so many examples of this, folks. We don't really need another example. Listen, the concepts of free market work like the concepts of gravity. They work every time. Supply and demand. It's the one of the oldest concepts going. There's really no way, other way to look at it. But the government always says, but we can do it better. Since when? Show me one example where government has actually done anything better than the free market. I can give you a litany of, of examples, not the least of which is the post office, who's now going to start delivering on Sundays for Amazon. <laughs> Talk about a last-ditch effort to save your own butt. I mean, unbelievable. You know, the truth is, this administration and all of the liberal progressives out there are the only thing that they bank on is is quid pro quo, this for that. And the perfect example of that is the fact that the Obama administration pressured everyone to actually sign on to Obamacare in the first place with kickbacks and and payoffs and threats and coercion and abuse. And quite frankly, the word tyranny should be inserted here. And the and the other side is that in that in that claim to, to get it resolved, they they didn't benefit those people who were actually responsible to pay for it all and who are going to have to live under it. But they weren't interested in what was right for you. They were only interested in how could they get their agenda accomplished. The details and and the consequences be hanged. Now the labor unions are calling in their chip. We got you elected, and you better do what we're telling you to do. What we're telling you that you're going to do is give us a waiver. Really now? Okay, so... Let's understand this. Everybody gets a waiver except two. The average American bloke who's getting raked? (laughs) I mean, come on. Kaiser Health, this is a uh, uh, the, the group that is by both sides of the fence and pretty much everybody involved, the number one group out there who, you know, evaluates healthcare and all the issues surrounding it, right? And they're reporting that in order to pay back his union support, he's about to give them a waiver from this draconian monstrosity. So let's see. Congress is exempt. All of their staff is exempt. The unions are exempt. Religious groups like Islam are is exempt, but Christians are not. Big business gets an extra year to evaluate and watch the debacle as it ensues and and, 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 and expands itself. And then they get a determination that they or they get the time to determine what do we need to do to benefit ourselves? They got a waiver for a year. So they get the chance to assess the damage and then lobby for their changes, which will benefit them. Basically, who's left holding the bag? Yeah, we the people. We get the Obama shaft. The truth is, if we allowed free free market and free enterprise and capitalism to operate here, we would have some benefits. Now, I told you all, um, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago about three different organizations that were out there that offer alternatives that qualify you, by the way, to be exempted from Obamacare by participating in their plan. And what they do is they're not insurance, but what they do is they share costs. These are religious organizations, and they are Christian, by the way, but they've figured out a way, at least until Harry Reid and and Nancy get a hold of it and block them, they've figured out a way that you can, it's kind of like self-insure through them, but it qualifies under Obamacare. But there's another organization out there that started up in New York, believe it or not, in New York, probably one of the most liberal, progressive 
uh, dominated uh, areas of the country. And they've called it Oscar. This is a startup that may revolutionize healthcare. That's their that's their uh, it's in the New York Post. The article says, starting with the premise that health insurance companies should relieve and not create headaches, a group of venture capitalists and healthcare professionals believe they have the right prescription. This group is actually gotten together, and they've got some really strong legs on this. We're not talking about, you know, a couple of people. They're talking 35,000 doctors and 72 hospitals that anybody who's a policyholder under this Oscar care or Oscar Healthcare can participate and use. Wow. That's quite a statement. 35,000 doctors and 72 hospitals. And by the way, CVS uh, Pharmacy has, you know, gotten together to be the the outlet for their uh, for, you know, services for prescriptions and things like that and pharmacy stuff. Now, this is a privately held company and it was started with in capitalistic, uh, you know, in, in capitalistic tones, venture capital money. And they got approval this summer, this past summer, from state regulators to open this new insurance company. And all they sell is health care. They've been working on this idea for a decade, and they've raised tens of millions of dollars to start the company. Here's what uh, Kevin Nazimi says. Excuse me, he's one of the co-founders. We think... We simply think that consumers deserve better. We have found very few people who are happy with their existing experience with their health insurance. And that was the drive for us to create something that is transparent. For example, he says, this will include letting consumers know the price of a doctor on one side of the street and the price of a doctor on the other street. We also want to use technology so that consumers feel like he or she has a doctor in the family. Now, when we talk about it from that perspective, you got to recognize that this is the first healthcare insurance company that uh, is is beginning operations in New York and the Empire State in a decade, and they're banking their own money on it. Big difference here, folks. They're not banking on the uh, on the largesse of the nation and the and the backs of the taxpayers. They're putting their own money there, and that means that. Under free market principles and and free enterprise principles, it will be successful. You know why? It has to be. Unlike the government where it doesn't really matter whether it's successful or not, free enterprise requires it to be successful or it goes down in flames. Now, I've heard all the arguments about whether or not free market and free free market enterprise and capitalism are good or bad. The truth is, we've actually never found it. We've, we've never experienced it. Not true f- laissez-faire, free market, free enterprise capitalism. We've never experienced it. Because the government has always got its hand interjected in there, somehow or other, to change the, the, to change the positioning and to, change, to, to, to skew the realities of the marketplace. Monopolies, ladies and gentlemen, they can only be created with government not only approval but assistance. If you don't have government participation, you cannot have a monopoly. You cannot. It's not possible. Because somebody will figure out a way to do it better and faster and cheaper and create a competitive environment that then that company will begin to lose market share. That's the truth. And that's how, frankly, we got along until these guys in government decided to put their clammy mitts into the mix and start to skew and twist and and modify everything. I'm not saying that there's not a place for government to oversee that no one is creating a free market capitalistic enterprise that harms others in their attempt to succeed. But I am going to say that setting... Setting the tone and the tenor is different than picking the winners and the losers. Big difference.
Now, this this group includes 35,000 doctors and 72 hospitals that Oscar policyholders can can use. CVS Caremark is their pharmacy. You know what? Here's here's their here's the difference in their attitude versus the Obamacare mandate. Oscar, a privately held company, begins with considerable financial resources and expertise. Its board of directors includes billionaire venture capitalist <coughs> Vinod Kasla and Charlie Baker, the former head of Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. But can it turn a profit? Oscar executives say the challenge of healthcare is the same as that of any other business, namely finding and keeping customers. Not by imprisoning them, but by offering them something better than the competition. Quote, if you are treating your members badly, and a large group of them are leaving each year, and then you have to spend a bunch of money to market to and get new members, then it's hard to build a viable business, says Nazimi. But if you deliver great consumer experience and members stay with you for the long term, then it's a very viable business. Ladies and gentlemen, in an acorn shell, that is and sums up the principles of capitalism. Provide a good quality product that people feel confident that they're getting a good deal and they will stay with you. Betray that relationship and they won't. It's that simple. The only time that the entire thing gets shifted around is when government says you can't leave them or they can be the only provider available. Then suddenly everything changes. That's the same argument that I give to having this this case that, look, I'll give you, here's the perfect example. One of the things that was talked about before Obamacare came into reality was the idea of opening up insurance companies to offer insurance, health insurance services across state lines, right? Here's the perfect example. Obamacare has actually gone further than that. They've restricted not just in, in not just to within state lines. In some cases, like in California, they've actually restricted it down to the county. In other words, you can't see a doctor or go to a hospital or use a medical facility outside of the area, the immediate area you live in. That's even more draconian than the original health care plans that were out there in the first place. How absurd. So we took what everybody uh, considered to be a logical step of saying, well, let's just open up the insurance policies, the insurance companies to offer policies across state lines. And first of all, that will enable competition. And we said, and, and, and with Obamacare, we said, nope, let's narrow it even further and double down on what we know to be a disastrous policy that we can already see the fruits of. How ridiculous. Meanwhile, the unions are doing exactly the opposite. They're lobbying their money not to create something better, but to say, we don't really care what you created. Just make sure that we're not a part of it. And don't forget, by the way, that we're the ones who paid your way to put you here. Wow. Wow. Look at the difference there, huh? You know why? Because unions aren't free market either, are they? Think about that for a moment. What's free market and free enterprise about a union that says you must join in order to work here and you must pay dues because you're a member and we get to use that money for our own purposes and our own agenda? which ultimately we tell you will trickle down to you, but you have no assurance of that. And if you opt out or you, or you, you object, too bad. Now, who's dictatorial and who's free enterprise now, huh? You see, unions are government in microcosm. Albeit, they have a much more focused agenda. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But they utilize the principles of coercion and pressure to accomplish the task. 
which is to make you enslaved to an agenda that is not your own. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the difference. And capitalism is now such a dirty word in our society because of the liberal progressive agenda and the way that the leftists have have driven that concept home to most Americans. Ask Americans on the street. Do yourself a favor and do your own little poll. In the next 48 hours, just go up to 10 people that you know but don't really have a, a, you know, a, a day in and day out relationship with and ask them what they think of capitalism. First of all, out of the 10, you'll be lucky if you can get six or seven who actually even understand the market and, and the concepts of capitalism. Most people don't. You know why? Because our schools don't teach it. You know why? Because the teachers' unions don't want it taught. You know why? Because it is not conducive to their agenda to show something like competition. They don't want competition. Unions thrive in a vacuum of competition. That is their exclusive domain. Excuse me. And the truth is, what we have is an administration that operates on the same principles, paying off a benefactor at your cost and expense. Because remember that unions, although they're only 11% of the American population, the workers within unions, for those people to opt out of Obamacare means that the rest of us got to pick up their 11% lack of or slack. Oh. Didn't think of it that way, did you? You see, every person who gets opted out means the rest of us got to carry a greater amount of weight. So here we are on a journey, and we're going across the nation, and everybody's got a knapsack on. Here we are, a bunch of military guys, and everybody's carrying a 100-pound pack. But some guys go up to the, to the, to the, uh, the leader of the, of the platoon, and they say, hey, listen, you know, <clears throat> I've done some good things for you in the past, and this pack is awful bad. So why don't you take my pack and divvy it up amongst the other guys and make them carry my weight? Because that's what's happening, America. Every person who gets opted out, who waves out, that means you're going to carry more weight of this. And you don't have an option. You're doing it under orders. It's different if you said, hey, listen, Bob, I see you're struggling there. Let me carry some of that stuff for you. It's different if Bob says, hey, listen, I am having a really hard time here because I got this bad knee. So I tell you what, anybody who wants to carry 11% of my pack, I'll pay you. And a half a dozen guys say, okay, I'll I'll take some. That's different. That's capitalism. But when the sergeant comes back down the line and he says, Bob doesn't want to carry this pack. And you you guys are going to split it up. And you're going to carry it. And everybody says, wait a minute, why does he get a break? It doesn't matter why he gets a break. I'm the sergeant. This is what I'm telling you is going to happen, and that's the way it is. Wow. Whole different tone, isn't it? The truth of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, if we allowed capitalism to operate, if the Republicans who staunchly advocate capitalism, or at least verbally, They don't believe in it and they don't follow the mantra of it and they don't actually ever exercise it. But if they did, assuming we can leap the the chasm of of logic here or their illogical behavior in the face of their own verbal pronouncements, then let's take a look at what the Republican Party can do to salvage itself. They won't, but let's just look at it objectively for a moment. The first things that they can do would be to say that we're going to do the right thing by the principles of capitalism, which will ultimately achieve our goal of allowing most Americans 
the most Americans to gain health insurance at the lowest possible cost. Isn't that really the whole idea of Obamacare, at least in concept? Now, granted, you know, it looks like a shiny gold orb. But as you get closer, you see it's all pockmarked and full of cuts and bruises and bangs. Because the way that they're accomplishing it is not by free and open marketplace. It's by oppression. If they really, truly wanted the lowest possible cost for the greatest number of people, there's plenty of ways to accomplish that, utilizing the principles of free market. But these guys are so sold out to the, to the entities that benefit from the lack of a free market, and they're so conditioned to utilize government intervention to achieve its own skewed viewpoint. You know, everybody in politics looks at every situation kind of like a Picasso painting. It's all out of sync. It's all out of whack. It's the, you know, the whole concept is off. You ever see that painting where the, the 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 clock is melting over the face of the over the face of the corner of the table and the trees are all skewed and they're all out of shape and they're not in proportion? That's how they view the world. The rest of us look at it and say, "No, nope, that's a clock hanging on the wall." And they see it as some LSD induced hallucination. Why? Because they've been paid to look at it that way. And the money is coursing through their veins like the LSD is coursing through the the twisted mind of the hallucinogenic. It's no different. They cannot look clearly at it until they have been purged of the mind-altering substance. What is that mind-altering substance? Money, power, influence. That's it. If the Republicans truly cared about, one, saving themselves, and two, saving the nation, doing the real work of the nation, they would come up with an alternative solution. And there are lots of brilliant minds out there who have them. I mean, the first guy who jumps to mind is Dr. Ben Carson and his promotion of the idea of health savings accounts. All right, so the poor don't have them. Great, we'll give them a tax credit to cover it. Maybe we'll actually give them the cash back at the end of the year to cover it or something. I don't care. But the truth of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, it would be infinitely less expensive for the rest of America if we did it that way. And we would incorporate and enhance our freedom our liberty, our privacy, and we would reduce the level of government intervention in our lives. You see, those four principles tell you why it will never work with either the Democrats or the Republicans. Because once we leap back across the chasm, we look at the reality of the situation and we recognize it for what it is. Both parties are either subverted and and diverted from reality, either by ideological uh, imbibing of of the hallucinogen or the imbibing of it from just a sheer greed perspective. But both people have taken the mind-altering drug, and we're left with the skewed results of their view. And that is a shame. If America ever wants to succeed, we have got to get a true group of individuals who accurately represent our own interests and our own needs in this nation. And what we have today, the current crop, is so poisoned that I'll tell you right now, you eat any of the fruit off of that vine, and you're eating off the fruit of the tree of treason, number one, and number two, it's poison. It is poison. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to tackle our last topic of this morning, the Ministry of Propaganda's credibility or lack thereof. 
And I got to tell you, there was an excellent article about how the New York Times cheerleading for Obama is harming the nation by Michael Goodwin from the New York Post. Again, I referenced this in the very beginning of the show. This is an excellent article, and I really want you to take a look at it because I think it really hits the nail on the head and expresses the truth of where we are today. You're listening to America's Voice Now. You can find us on the web by visiting our website at americasvoicenow.org. You can go to .com, too. It'll take you to the same place. You can contact me to give me your feedback on this and any other program that we do by sending me an email to mike at americasvoicenow.org. And agree with me, disagree with me, either is okay. I want to hear your feedback. All right, did you like the show? Is it good? Does it help you? Does it give you information that you didn't have before? Does it motivate you to go out there and do your own homework to formulate your own opinion? Does it help you in some way? Does it hurt you? I want to hear your opinions. Tell me. You can send them to me at mike at americasvoicenow.org. You can also find us on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash America's Voice Now. And there you can, if you're a member of Facebook, click the like button and join with us. If not, you can still see and review the articles, comments, ideas, and stories that we post up there every day. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hang on to your seats. When we come back, the Ministry of Propaganda's lack of credibility. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. 